So welcome to Plodcast, episode 71. Good to have you here. Thank you for listening. So um, I want to begin by talking. Uh, it occurred to me that I ought to spend a little time on some off-the-beaten-track opinions, or, or maybe I should share some unpopular opinions, or share some things that don't, uh, are not greeted with universal acclaim. Um, and one of them, and this comes up from time to time in different ways, in different settings, and so on, but uh, one of the controverted issues among exegetes is what to do with the sons of God marrying the daughters of men in um, Genesis chapter 6. Whatever it was, it was a big deal because apparently it, it was a... Uh, one of the factors that led to the flood. I like to say it precipitated the flood. You know what? <laughs> Haha. So, um, since the time of the Reformation, it has uh, grown increasingly customary for Christians to say that the sons of God were basically um, the descendants of the line of Seth and the daughters of men were uh, descended from Cain and that the sin involved was the intermarriage of the godly line, um, the godly seed of Seth with the ungodly line of, uh, of Cain. And the, there, I, I, I have a number of difficulties with this, and I take the older view um, that the sons of God, are, B'nai Elohim, um, are celestial beings of some sort, and they intermarry with... Uh, Human women, and that seems a little bit um, outlandish to modern ears. And so, uh, obviously, the uh, intermarriage between Seth and the line of Seth and the line of Cain, at, at least, is not um, embarrassing that way. So, I, I thought I would I would mention just a few reasons why um, I take the line I do, and um, and here it goes. So first, um, uh, elsewhere in the Old Testament, B'nai Elohim, when that, when that phrase occurs, it, it refers to celestial beings. It refers to angelic beings and not to um, human men. Secondly, uh, it, if it's a human intermarriage, if it's simply the godly line, godly line of Seth intermarrying with um, human women, excuse me, um, the, the women of Cain's line, then it's odd that you would have all the um, masculinity on one side, all the males on one side, and all the women on the other. Um, it would be the sons and daughters of the line of Seth and the sons and daughters of the line of, of Cain. Uh, if it were simple uh, intermingling of two human lines. Um, but there is, the, the, you don't have that oddity if it's the uh, the kind of transgression that I think is worthy bringing worthy to bring about a flood. Um, uh, next, it it would be um, odd if the an intermarriage of the godly line of Seth and the human uh, the the ungodly line of Cain resulted in giants. Uh, why why would um, a compromise. Why would a spiritual or covenantal compromise result in Nephilim, um, uh, mighty men of renown? Uh, you could you could see that h how um, an intermarriage of celestials and uh, human women would res would result in some r remarkable offspring. But why why would it happen if it was just two human uh, human lines? And that brings up one of the standard objections. Um, uh, Jesus says that in the resurrection we neither marry nor are given in marriage but are like the angels. So it's said that uh, clearly angels can't do this thing that you're attributing to them. Well, Jesus doesn't say that they can't. Uh, he says that they don't. And the angels that don't are the angels that did not leave their proper office. They did not leave their proper station. Another thing worth mentioning is throughout uh, pagan uh, literature, you have these stories of the gods intermarrying with human women or having children by them. And, and many of the remarkable men of old are the offspring of 
uh, a god on one side and human on the other. And, of course, in pagan thinking, the god or the goddess would be, uh, in biblical terminology, an angel, a cre uh, created being. Uh, the biblical worldview does not reject the existence of gods, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't uh, treat them as um, necessary beings. In other words, they're created beings just like, just like we are, but they are somehow um, of a higher order. Somehow, So Paul says in Corinthians, they're God's many and Lord's many. But for us, there's only one God. There's only one, uncre only one uncreated God. Uh, the other thing is, the other argument here is that in uh, Jude, when it's talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, um, there's a pronoun that links the behavior of Sodom and Gomorrah um, uh, to the behavior of the angels who left their proper estate. Um, and the angels who abandoned their estate in the same manner to these, these being Sodom and Gomorrah, um, went after strange flesh. So in Sodom and Gomorrah, the sexual perversion was of a homosexual variety. In, uh, um, in the rebellion that brought about the flood, it was a, a sexual rebellion that transgressed, you might say, the line of species where you had um, uh, celestial beings going after, going after strange flesh. So bring this all, um, if, if we want to make it relevant, bring it back to the present. Um, the, the flood was brought about not because people were staying out at the taverns too late prior to the flood or they were playing cards too much or that they, they you know, were carrying on. Uh, it was actually a, a grand experiment in genetic engineering. They were, they were trying to attain to eternal life without get, because they were cut off from the tree of life. They, they were living a long time before the flood, eight, nine hundred years, but that was, they still died. They were still, death was still a thing. And so they were trying to uh, crack the code. They were trying to figure out a way to live forever without, uh, without coming back to God in repentance, without being given by grace access to the tree of life. And so that's why God says, I will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be 120 years. So I, I take that as that's how much left time is left before the flood. There you go. Plodcast, episode 71. Um, my book review this time is... Uh, a book that was a thing maybe a year ago it was uh, it was kind of kind of all the buzz, and I missed it that time around. But I finally got around to li uh, listening it on listening to it on uh, Audible this last week and really enjoyed it. Uh, the book is Hillbilly Elegy by J D Vance. Hillbilly Elegy by J D Vance. Now, um, this was uh, th this book was published in kind of a masterpiece of uh, good timing um, uh, because it was published right before uh, the election of Donald Trump or it was it do, it's not all about Donald Trump but it it really helps explain the life and desperation of many of the people who uh, support supported him so um, JD Vance uh, grew up in a hillbilly family uh, the family had deep roots in Kentucky and they had transplanted early on to uh, Ohio and uh, J.D. Uh, had a family that was something of a train wreck. I should say at the beginning that I was expecting this to be the memoir of someone with hillbilly chops. Yeah, that's not something you hear that often, but someone who had street cred as someone who came from that people, but uh, someone doing sort of a demographic analysis or a, like a larger uh, um, demographic discussion of what's going on in America. And there's some of that. But the book is largely autobiographical. And then you render general by induction. And you say, that you can see that this is what this uh, quadrant of the population is like. So it's a, it's a memoir and autobiography. J.D. Vance 
uh, grew up in a train wreck of, his, uh, of a family, didn't really know his uh, biological dad. His mom um, went through a series of relationships. His mom had trouble with drugs. Um, and the men in her life would be men who would be there for a short time and then gone. Um, and J.D. liked a number of them fine, but he knew not to count on them, knew, knew that they weren't going to be very, there very long. Uh, he, uh, he the, the anchors for the family were the grandparents, Mama and Papa, um, who had some troubles of their own, but at least they uh, provided a great deal of um, sort of an anchor of stability for uh, Vance growing up. And uh, um, he, as he grew up, he describes his time in school and de- describes uh, some of the showdowns with his mother and describes how easily the whole thing could have gone off the rails when he um, he gets uh, when he graduates from high school, which he does do, uh, he joins the Marines and does a stint in the Marines and the Marines toughen him up and teach him discipline, teach him a number of things. And then after after the Marines, he goes to Ohio State and after Ohio State, he goes to Yale Law School. So the end result is a strange sort of amphibian, um, a person who has is able to sort of walk the corridors of power, a person who is very much part of the uh, ruling class uh, on the outside and very much understands the trials and woes and the tribulations of the working class poor. So for, for Vance, the 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 tribulations of the working class poor, for him, he's still relatively a young man, uh, for him, uh, those uh, things are not a tiny speck in the rearview rear mirror. They're part of his past, but they're a, a very present um, part of his past. He writes with a great deal. Of, he really pulls off a, an astonishing balancing act, I think, in this book, because he writes... Um, he writes about a dysfunctional family, and he writes about uh, a dysfunctional culture in many respects with a great deal of sympathy and affection, but without whitewashing the very real problems that are uh, the destructive patterns, the destructive uh, behaviors that uh, in hillbilly culture, in, in white, white Appalachian culture, uh, basically destroy people's lives. Uh, and and he makes all the appropriate distinctions between the, the person who's just raking in the welfare and the person who's part of the working poor and so forth. But even even the people who work hard, even the people with a work ethic, are capable of living destructive uh, lives you know, simultaneously. There are people who are destroying their lives and can't hold down a job. And then, then there are people who can hold down a job, but uh, nevertheless destroy their marriages or their relationship with their kids and so forth through anger or, you know, whatever the problem, uh, whatever the problem might be. Um, one note to uh, tag onto this, uh, Hillbilly Elegy uh, has some, uh, the, well, I listened to it on Audible and the book is read by the authors, read by Vance himself. So I had this sensation of riding around with him in my truck, you know, with him telling me stories. Uh, so that cl- that closed the rhetorical distance a, a great deal. At the same time, he um, the language is in places uh, kind of rough, so you don't want to be listening to it with your five-year-old sweet daughter on the way to Christian school because she might be asking you what certain words mean. Uh, so I don't think he uses, I don't think he does that gratuitously or for, um, or for shock value. I think he's simply being, a, simply, reporting. Um, and it's a powerful book. It's a moving book. And it really helps you understand how um, uh, a figure like Donald Trump, even though Trump is not discussed uh, in this book much at all, if at all, um, it really helps you understand where somebody might be when they looked at um, Donald Trump, someone like Donald Trump as a, as a real uh, deliverer.
episode 71 we have uh, we've come to our hamartiology section and we come to the sin of subversion the sin of subverting things the edict from the jerusalem council that was um, an edict that was seeking to reassure the gentile christians said that certain men who claimed to be representing the thought of the church leaders were actually just troubling people and subverting souls. Uh, it says that in Acts 15, 24. These, these people had gone out in the name of representing what the church thought, and they were subverting souls. Uh, the word there is anas, uh, anaskuadzo. Um, they were overthrowing or subverting or undermining souls. The way that they were doing this was through insisting that Gentiles become Jews submitting themselves to the discipline of circumcision and all that that entailed. Uh, So obviously, if you took on circumcision, that meant you were binding yourself to keep the entire Mosaic law. Uh, This was rejected by the first great church council. To add works to the gospel is to tunnel under it, subverting it, and subverting human souls at the same time. So uh, subverting, undermining, Uh, eroding the foundations of, that's a bad thing. God in the time of the sickness, God in the doctor You've spent a pleasant half hour with podcast proprietor Douglas Wilson. This podcast is produced by Canon Press. Please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite listening platform. To hear more from Doug, please visit canonpress.com.